Allah Azza wa Jal in Surah Al-Kahf, a surah that we're supposed to recite every Friday, mentions four stories. And the third of these stories involves Musa alayhi salam, and it's the only time that the story has been mentioned. It's a very different part of his life, and it's a very personal journey. Most of the time when you read about Musa alayhi salam, it's either him directly speaking with Allah, or he's engaged with the Israelites, or he's challenging the Pharaoh, and it's a very public role, or a leadership role. But in this particular story, it's very different from all the other things we learn about Musa salam. As a matter of fact, there are so many mysteries about this story, we don't even know exactly where to place this in his life. We know that it seems to have happened after they crossed the water, but exactly when historically and where he went, we don't know. And Allah chose not to tell us. But some things I want you to know about today for the purpose of this khutbah, uh, and I, I don't, my intention is not to actually tell you the entire story, but to highlight something Allah said within this profound uh, account that Allah has mentioned. Uh, and that is that uh, Allah Azza wa in describing Musa salam, first of all, the most talked about Prophet in the entire Qur'an. Nobody's mentioned by name more than Musa salam. And of course, he's been given the book, uh, which then became the book that more Prophets taught than any other Prophet. Meaning Allah gave him Torah, and after he gave him Torah alayhi salam, every generation after him had a Prophet, and they, they taught Torah again, and again, and again, and again, and again. So more prophets were students of what he was given than any other prophet. So also, of course, Allah Azza wa Jal describes the people that ascribe themselves to him, the Jewish community, he t- describes them as ahbar, people of ink, people of knowledge, right? And ulama Bani Israel, Quran uses the word scholars, or people of knowledge of the Israelites, meaning these are people that actually have profound knowledge. This is something they have from Allah that Allah Azza wa Jal gave them even after the changes they made to the book. There's still some knowledge that they possess. So Allah highlights the knowledge and the highest status of Musa salam over and over again in the Quran. But then in this story, he is not the teacher, he's the student. Musa salam, who is in every other case, scenario a teacher, is now a student. And this is not early on, you know, when you think of education, early on in your career, you're learning, you're a student, and when you get certain qualifications, then after that, you become a teacher. That's the normal progression of things. But this, from what we can tell, is actually happening much later on in the life of Musa much after he's been a teacher. As a matter of fact, he's been a teacher to the Israelites. He's already received the Torah. He has been teaching on behalf of Allah Azza wa Jal. And if we're to accept the authenticity of the narration, it's even claimed that nobody was more knowledgeable on earth than Musa alayhi that he didn't know of anyone who had more knowledge. And yet Allah tells him, there's someone who knows more than you do, and you need to go learn from him. And so this really interesting story is now about someone who we, from what we can tell in the Qur'an, was given more knowledge than anybody else, and yet Allah is telling him that you need to go learn from someone else. Now the more someone is learned, the more qualifications they have, credentials they have, the higher status they have in society. I'm not even talking about religious knowledge. If somebody's got a PhD, it's a form of respect. If somebody's a professor in university, it's a kind of prestige. We know that. When, when, even when, this is why we, we celebrate people that graduate. Whether you're graduating high school or college or you got a master's degree or you got a PhD or with Islamic studies you got an ijaza or you finished memorizing the Qur'an. Whenever somebody accomplishes something in education, their status is increased. They're more recognized in the society. People listen to them and they have more validity. And yet, this person who Allah describes as more knowledgeable, clearly as even, more even than Musa alayhi salam, rather Musa alayhi salam is traveling an exhaustive amount to come learn from him, nobody knows him. Nobody knows him. As a matter of fact, the most interesting thing, one of the most interesting things, is that we don't even know his name. The Qur'an, Allah did not mention his name. Yes, in the narrations we learned the name Khidr or Khadr, and there are variations of that spelling that are, that are mentioned. But Allah in His perfect speech decided not to tell us who is this teacher of Musa He didn't tell him his name. So how did Allah describe him? That's, this is where I want to begin really today. He says, فَوَجَدَ عَبْدًا مِنْ عِبَادِنَا Meaning Musa salam and his young assistant, they traveled together and they eventually found, listen to this carefully now, a slave from among our slaves which is probably in, in closer English expression would be just one of our slaves. They just found one of our slaves. One of our slaves is a description of all of us. That's not a special description. We're learning something profound here. To Allah Azza wa Jal, the height, the more someone gains knowledge, the more someone gains knowledge, the more they are identified as just another one of Allah's slaves. That doesn't make them more special than anyone else. 
It actually makes them realize إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ I'm just among everybody else. I'm not superior to anybody else. You see, every other knowledge, when somebody gains it, somebody gets a degree, they kind of like get a little full of themselves. Like if, they, if, they, if they're going to a convention and they've got a PhD, they're not just going to say Abdul Karim. They're going to say, Dr. Abdul Karim, comma, PhD. Wait, let me put the P with double marker and H and D, you know. Or you introduce yourself to someone, hey, my name is uh, Salman. No, 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 my name is Dr. Salman. Or, you know, your email ID, whatever. It, it doesn't say Zainab, it says Zainab MBA. Or whatever. You know, you have to add your credential because it's a form of, I'm something. I, I have some value, you know. And people love throwing that on. I, I'm reminded back in the day when I was in college, this is in the 1800s. But when I used to go to, you know, MSA conventions, my friends, just for fun, they'd put their name. Like he's like the second year of college, he's putting his name, Dr. Faris Mahmoud, PhD, times 10. And they have his label. <laughs> But the idea that credentials give you a kind of status. And what, what is that status with Allah? Well, if you really truly have knowledge, and if I really truly have knowledge, then we recognize the highest status with Allah of the highest knowledge is that I'm just a slave. I am in, and the, the word slave I use deliberately. I didn't say servant. I said slave because it's kind of an offensive term. Right? And literally, in the Arabic language, I have to try to translate the Arabic of the Qur'an as close to the English as possible. I'm not trying to be politically correct. I'm trying to be accurate from a language point of view. Abd actually does mean slave. And yes, slave is an offensive term. But I want you to understand why that's used. Because slavery to anyone other than Allah is humiliation. But slavery to Allah is an honor. It's actually freedom. And also, you, can, you can't think of any title... Any title that somebody could give you that could be lower than slave. Like whoever has a job in the world, any role in the world, when they take that role, there is no more humble, more lower a title than that one. Here you have someone who has higher and higher, the highest knowledge, and yet he's, all he is is abdan, a slave. And on top of that, it's not al-abd. It's not even mu'arraf billam. It's not even the servant. Like this is the man to learn from. No, just any servant. He's the, there's an anonymity to him. This is profound because it teaches us something about what it means to truly learn Islam. When somebody's truly <coughs> learning the knowledge of Allah, then actually they are more and more and more within everyone else, not above. They're not above them. They are more humbled than they are full of their credentials. Do you know where I graduated from? Do you know what degree I have? Do you have any jaza in this? Do you, did you study under this shaykh? None of that matters now. That disappears. I'm reminded of a really interesting incident I, uh, or experience. Uh, almost over a year ago, I traveled to Oman and Sultanat Oman in Masqat. And we had a program there. There was a program that I attended in a masjid uh, for about seven days. It was a, in Etikaf. There were about 500 of us that stayed there. And there were, this was a, a, a steady program for just reflecting on the Quran. That's what it was. And there were rules for attending this program. And one of the rules was you have to leave your cell phone, astaghfirullah al You have to leave your cell phone with the, the custodians. And if, if there's an emergency, they'll contact them. But for seven days, you don't have your phone. I don't even know how you can breathe without your phone anymore. But we, we did it somehow. So there's no phone with us. Then the second thing was you can only mention your name. And you can only mention where you're from. But you can't say anything else about yourself. Nothing else. There were people there that were scholars of hadith. There were people there that were millionaires. There were people there that were shuyu mashayikh that are teaching their whole life. There were people there that own two camels and that's their entire life is taking care of those camels. There were people there that were taxi drivers. But we don't know who's who. Nobody knows who's who. All you can say is ismi kada wa kada wa anamin and that's it. That's all. And you don't say this is how old I am. This is what I do for a living. This is what my job is. Nope, nothing. And when you're going to discuss Qur'an, you can't even quote scholars or technical Arabic things or whatever because that might give somebody a clue, this guy is a scholar. So you can't talk like that. You have to keep everything basic. This is part of the rules, right? And the vast majority of the people that attended were, I was probably one of the only few that wasn't a scholar. Like, there were, were scholars in this audience. But it was an exercise in humility. It was a profound exercise in humility for seven days. Just to be abdan min ibadina. Just to be that. Just to be a servant from within our servants. You see, Shah Waliullah Dahlwi rahimahullah said something beautiful. It stuck with me as soon as, since I heard it in my youth. He described somebody who has true knowledge. He said, 
when a, when a tree bears fruit, its branches lower. When the tree bears fruit, it, its branches lower. The idea meaning if you've truly borne the fruit of knowledge, then there's a humility that impacts you. It, you, you come lower. You don't think of yourself as higher. When somebody's questioning you, criticizing you, in your head, you're not processing, who are you to ask me? Excuse me, what do you know? Are you even on YouTube? You're going to ask me? That's not what's going on in your head. That's not what's going on in my head. This is the attitude of Abdan min ibadina. Now, Musa alayhi salam was given ilmul kitab. He was given knowledge of revelation. This is the next part of what I want to share with you. Musa alayhi salam was given Torah, which is the word of Allah. It's the Quran of that time. It's actually even in one place in the Quran described as another Quran. This is what they were given. So it's a profound, that's the word of Allah that he's learned. So how is he going to learn something more profound or different from the word of Allah? He already learned the word of Allah. So how is he learning from someone else? You see, there are two kinds of knowledge. There's two kinds of knowledge. There's the knowledge of Allah's words. And there's knowledge of reality. This is what we're going to learn in the story. There's knowledge of Allah's words. And there's knowledge of reality. And just because somebody has learned, profoundly learned, and internalized the knowledge of Allah's words, that doesn't necessarily mean they've been able to truly understand the knowledge of what? Reality. reality. Those are two different things. And the scholar that he's going to learn from, he's been given the other knowledge, the knowledge of reality. He's been given that kind of knowledge, not knowledge of the book. The knowledge of the book is with Musa alayhi salam. And it's profound knowledge, it's the height of knowledge. But this is a different kind of knowledge. And that's the other reason I wanted to highlight why is it that Allah Azza wa Jal mentions His humility so powerfully and then adds, وَآتَيْنَاهُ رَحْمَةً مِنْ عِنْدِنَا وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّا عِلْمًا Listen to this part carefully. The first thing is, He's just one of our slaves. That's it. He's just one of our slaves. The second thing is, Allah especially gave him a mercy. And then says, and we taught him especially from our behalf. Meaning, Allah taught him what could not have been taught to anybody else by, by anyone else. Especially to him, some knowledge was given of reality. He was able to see reality in a way that we can't see. This was something especially given to him. But the thing I want you to focus on is, Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned that he gave him mercy before he mentioned knowledge. Mercy first, knowledge second. Why is that important that Allah gave him mercy? That Allah especially granted him a mercy. You see, this is what's called atf bayan in Arabic. There are some kinds of knowledge that if you have them, there is no greater mercy on you than that knowledge. Like if you know it, your life becomes easier. If you know it, you'll be happy. If you know it, your troubles will go away. What greater mercy that your heart is not going to be at unrest, that you're not going to be afraid anymore, you're not going to be sad anymore, you're not going to be disturbed anymore. You're constantly in a state of blessings. Because Allah has given you a mercy from Him. And what is that mercy? Some special kind of knowledge of reality. This is the knowledge that he's been given that becomes a mercy for him. Now, how does that operate? I'm not, again, I'm not going to tell you the story, but I want you to now, when you go home and you recite the story and read something of the translation or commentary on the story, think about these things. Allah Azza wa Jal takes, you know, uh, takes us along with this journey that Musa alayhi salam came to him and says, you know, Ala an mimma rushda. Can I follow you? Because you can teach me some of the things you've been taught. And the first thing he says to Musa is, uh, you don't possess the right prerequisites. You know, when you join a university, you have to have prerequisites. He says, you don't, the qualification that's needed is sabr. You don't have it. You're, you're not capable of being patient. You're not capable of holding back uh, with me. You're, you're not going to be able to handle it. This is too tough of a program. Musa salam won't be able to handle it. He was able to handle Fir'aun. He was able to handle crossing the water. He was able to handle the Israelites. He's, he's handled quite a bit. You know, he's been, he's been able to handle people trying to kill him. And he says, you can't have sabr with me. And this is the same Musa alayhi salam who's telling the Israelites to have sabr. He's telling them when the armies of the Pharaoh are coming, إِلَّا مَعْيَ رَبِّ سَيْهَدِي No, 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 it's okay. My master is with me. He'll guide. This is the hero of Islam, the, the highlight of the Qur'an. And this man tells Musa alayhi salam, you don't have enough sabr for this. You can't handle it. Subhanallah. Just to, just to even think about who's being said this, to, this, this is being said to Musa alayhi salam, you know. And so when he says that, of course, Musa alayhi salam says, no, sa tajiduni insha'Allah sabiran. It's a humble answer. He doesn't say, excuse me, 
You're gonna tell me about sabr? Let me tell you my sabr experience. Here's my sabr resume. No, no, no. He says, inshallah, if Allah wills, you will find that I have sabr. If Allah wills. He doesn't even guarantee that about himself. Like, look, yes, I have a pretty decent track record with sabr, but that doesn't guarantee that I'll always have it. If Allah wills, I hope that I will meet that expectation. Satajiduni insha'Allah sabirin. I want to spend the last few minutes of this khutbah talking to you about this knowledge of reality and how the sabr of Musa salam was tested and why that knowledge of reality becomes a mercy. I want you to think of it this way. Reality is two things. It's what you can see and what you cannot see. Right now, I can see you. I don't see the two angels on your sides. I don't see them. You understand that? So there's a, but they're real. They're here. So there's a reality that we can see and there's a reality that we cannot see. When Laylatul Qadr happens, you look up at the sky, it's just the sky. But the unseen reality is the, the sky is completely covered with angels descending. That's an unseen reality. You understand? So there's a seen reality and there is an unseen reality. Now, this knowledge, what we see all the time, all of our opinions, our feelings, our thoughts are always impacted by what we see. Because that's what reality is to us, what you see on the news, what you experienced, what somebody said to you, what you felt. These are your realities. But there's another side to that reality. It's like a source code. It's like you see the front end of the app, but you don't see the, the code behind the app. There's a, there's a curtain, there's a veil Allah put. And Allah Azza wa says on Judgment Day, فَكَشَفْنَا عَنْكَ غِطَاءَكَ فَبَصَرُكَ الْيَوْمَ حَدِيدٌ That we are removing the curtain from you so you can see crystal clear now. You, your, your, your vision is ironclad. In other words, now you don't just see what, what was visible. Now Allah is going to remove the veil and you can also see the unseen reality. The thing is in most of our life, and pretty much all of our life, we never know why Allah does what He does. We don't know. We don't know why you got into a car accident. We don't know. We don't know why you lost your job. We don't know why you got sick. We don't know why this problem happened or that problem happened. We don't know why your brother did so well in school and you failed. We don't know. We don't know why you're so short and your siblings are so tall. And you start asking yourself, why, why did Allah do this? What's the, why can't He just tell me what He wants from me? Why doesn't he open, lift the curtain a little bit? So let me see what the secret was. What was the big plan? So I can just, if I just knew, well, maybe I'd be at ease. Because when you don't know, you know, when a, when a judge passes a verdict on you, the judge says, you have to pay this fine. And you say, why should I pay this fine? And he says, no, that, that knowledge is in the unseen. I'm not going to tell you. When a judge passes a verdict on you and you don't know why, then you become at unrest. You're like, I can't accept that. I need an explanation. I can't have that explanation be hidden from me. What Allah does in this story is He shows Musa salam there's always an explanation. But Allah decided, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُطْلِعَكُمْ عَلَى الْغَيْبِ Allah has decided that He is not going to be informing you of what's happening in the unseen. Behind everything seen, there's something happening that is unseen and He has decided not to tell you. In this story, what Allah decided to do is He, you know, imagine there's a curtain and Allah lifted it you know, through his teacher, just a little bit, so you can get a glimpse, a little bit, you can see what's happening behind the scenes. So you understand there's always something happening, but he doesn't lift it all the time. This is a special knowledge given to Khidr salam, which is a special mercy to him. He doesn't give that to every, he didn't even give it to Musa salam, meaning this is a reality he doesn't even open to his messengers. That's the lesson we're learning here. So when Musa salam sees that people that are just earning a decent living and the only way they can make a living is a boat that they work on is being damaged by his teacher. Like, what are you doing? This is messed up. How can you do this? What could possibly justify this? And he's told, told you you're not going to handle this. This is not the kind of course you can take and survive. You don't have the patience for this. Meaning he doesn't have the patience to see injustice and just stand by. Musa salam, when he sees injustice, he gets upset. When he sees two people fighting each other, he doesn't just stand there, he goes and fixes it. When he sees women struggling to feed their animal, he goes and helps. When he sees an innocent boy being killed, or he sees a ship being sunk for no reason, of course he's going to have a problem. And this became his test of sabr. In other words, when you see, when you and I see unfairness in your personal life, in your circle, when you see unfairness done towards you or done towards others, and you start questioning, why is this unfairness happening? This isn't right. 
That can't be a good thing. And you start, you know, it, it agitates you. It really bothers you. It's at that point that those words of Khidr salam to, to Musa salam are, أَقُلْ إِنَّكَ لَن تَسْتَطِيعَ مَا يَسَبْرِ Did I tell you, this, this education, this, real, this, this knowledge is not easy to acquire. You, can't, you don't have the patience for this. This is why it's not given to everyone. You, you, you can't handle this. And he even made the statement, وَكَيْفَ تَصْبِرُوا عَلَى مَا لَمْ تُحِطْ بِهِ خُبْرًا how in the world can you be patient over something you have no knowledge or experience of? There's an experience of the unseen. Allah did not open up that experience to us. We can't possibly experience it. We have to be humble and just sit back and say, Allah knows and we don't know. Wallahu ya'lamu wa antum la ta'lamun. Allah knows and you don't know. Eventually when Musa salam was taught, okay, these are the things you couldn't bear. This is what was really going on. This, is, this was Allah's plan behind each of the events that took place. When, that hap- when that's described, then actually we realize this is one of the most important bits, parts of knowledge that if we don't humble ourselves to, if we truly don't humble ourselves to, then there's no point considering yourself and myself someone who wants to learn about Allah's deen. Let me say that again. When, uh, when we give ourselves completely to Allah's plan, that means we've humbled ourselves before Allah. We've trusted our teacher, who is Allah, and we've trusted the, the road He's taken us on. Even if that road becomes uncomfortable, our trust in Him doesn't go away. And that's not easy to do. If that wasn't even easy to do for a messenger like Musa alayhi salam, Allahu Musa taklima, the one who spoke to Allah directly, it wasn't even easy for him to do. That means it's not easy for you and me to do. This is one of the hardest things we have to do in life. Is to actually be able to just be okay with Allah's plan is to know at the end of the day, there is a larger plan. Now, please don't misunderstand what I'm trying to get across in this khutbah. I am not saying that when people treat you unfairly, and when people do wrong to you, or you see wrong happening, that you shouldn't say anything, it's Allah's plan. I, I'm going to take, you know, take the sabr approach and not say anything. That's not what's being said. It's being said about things that are out of our control. When things that are happening that are out of our control, there's always a plan in place. There's always something happening that, 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 that is from Allah. And we, us standing up for justice, us speaking out against the wrong that is happening, is an obligation we have on ourselves. But this is beyond that. It's, that's obvious. That's common sense. That's something that most of the Qur'an talks about. But there's an attitude before Allah Azza wa Jal that we have to humble ourselves. We have to, I have to really, really acknowledge in myself that I'm not going to question Allah. I'm not going to say, Ya Allah, I don't see the, the sense behind this plan. I don't get it. If I was planning, I would have done a better job. Ma'adullah. This is the thought that goes in someone's head. This is, this is the, the thing that has to be killed. Because my sense of planning, my decision making, in my head, you're thinking you're more merciful than Allah? You're thinking you're more just than Allah? You know, I, am I thinking that I'm a, I'm a better planner than Allah? I know better than Allah? I have more wisdom than Allah? Is that what I'm thinking? Because when I'm questioning His judgment like that, then I'm cl- there's clearly something wrong. Of course, we can get close to that sometimes. Even the angels got close to that at one point. They didn't understand why Adam was created. They didn't get it. They even asked Allah Azza wa Jalla, "Tajalu fiha man yufsidu fiha wa yasfiku dima." Are you going to put on the earth someone who's going to cause corruption and spill blood? We don't get it. But immediately, immediately, as soon as they said this, because they don't understand, it's okay. We can ask Allah, "Ya Rabb, I wish I understood why this is happening." Give me contentment to deal with what is happening. That's okay. But immediately, what did the angel say? And by the way, you're perfect. We're not questioning your perfection. We don't get it, but that doesn't mean that you're making the wrong decision at all. That's, that's humility. That's to be a abd of one of, one of the ibad of Allah. Abdan min ibadina. And this has nothing, on the one hand, you could have knowledge of the book, you could, have, you could know the Arabic language and have memorized the Qur'an and have studied hadith and you know all of those things, but this isn't there. Contentment with Allah's decree is not there. Contentment with it. Knowing that what Allah has done is better. Knowing that what Allah has done has wisdom behind it. Knowing what Allah has done, Allah is a better planner than you and I will ever be. And there's good in it, maybe that good is, you know, sometimes a, a plant grows within a couple of days, sometimes a plant grows in 20 years. Right? So the, the seed that you're experiencing now, we don't know the good of it will come now or it will go, come a hundred years from now. We don't know that. 
That's Allah's plan. That we can't have any knowledge of that. This is not something Allah Azza wa Jal decided to tell us. You know? And so Allah even in Surah Ali Imran, when Muslims were going through a difficult time, and this is the last thing I'll leave you with, Allah Azza wa Jal told the Muslims this. When they were questioning, you know, when, when we lost in Uhud, when we had we tremendous, we, we experienced tremendous loss in the Battle of Uhud. And Allah Azza wa Jal noticed that Muslims are even starting to ask, why did this happen to us? Why did we experience it? We have the Messenger of Allah with us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're the believers that we've sacrificed with Him. How can we experience this? Allah says, النَّاسِ These are the days we flip up and down between people. So Allah could know who truly believes. It's easy to believe when you're winning, isn't it? I want to see who really believes when you're what? You're losing. First time I studied this ayah, I used to live in New York. And back then, astaghfirullah, it was a New York Knicks fan. And if you know anything about the New York Knicks, Spike Lee is at every game. Or I don't know if he still is, but he was at every game. And he's got this giant, those shahada fingers, and he's waving. They could be down by 40 points. He's a believer. They call him a true believer. Right? Whether you're winning or not, he's, he's, not, he's, not, he's got faith. Three seconds left in the game, 40 point points down, and he's waving the shahada finger. You know, because <laughs> that's his faith. Well, you know what? That's why they call him a true believer. The idea being, when we are going through difficult times, that's actually when Allah wants to see whether we believe or not. That's actually when faith is truly, you know, te- not just tested, graded. Think of it as graded. That's what your actual grade is. Are you content with Allah at that time? So he says, I, you know, I just want to know who truly believes. I want to see. I want to see your faith in action. I want to see it put to the test. Another place he says, Allah will not leave you just comfortable the way you are. He won't. He'll give you a tough time until he can distinguish the filthy from the good and pure. Allah will not be telling you what's going on behind the scenes. He will not be telling you the real plan. He said that himself. This is the humility that is profound, so profound that even a messenger had to travel to learn it. And this is a, this is a journey we, you and I have to take in life, to really, truly let go, sometimes, of our complaints and of our questionings of Allah's plan. Just let yourself float, let yourself be, and you'll find yourself in peace, and Allah Azza wa will give you contentment in life that otherwise would never have come your way. May Allah Azza wa make us happy with His decree. May Allah Azza wa make us of those radiyallahu anhum wa radu anhu. Allah is pleased with them as they are pleased with Allah. As they are pleased with Allah. So may Allah Azza wa make us pleased with Him and make Him pleased with us. May Allah Azza wa make our difficulties easy for us. And may Allah not make any of our trials a reason for us to lose our faith in Him. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim. Wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum min ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإتاءة القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا